web map services, which are, effectively takes a picture of the image that you're interested in. So let's say it's a satellite image. Let's, let's change and say it's Landsat. Um, so it'd be a Landsat image of, say, Denmark. And you can make a, a, a web map service request and you get back a picture of that image. So it's, um, it's like a, a snapshot. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Dr. Alistair Graham and we're going to be talking about Earth observation and remote sensing. Even if you're not a remote sensing Earth observation scientist, I think you're going to enjoy this episode. We start off nice and gently, we give a few definitions of the, the difference, and we talk about the difference between Earth observation and remote sensing. We move on to talk about platforms and data and, and take it from there. Just before we get into the interview today, I want to take a few moments here just to thank our sponsor, Graphhopper. So Graphhopper are the creators behind a super fast routing optimization engine. So, so this is a directions API that you can build your own application on top of. And the problem that they're solving is often referred to as the traveling salesman problem. So given a list of locations, what is the optimal route that visits each location and returns to the starting point? So Graphhopper is doing this for multiple multiple vehicles of different profiles, different types. So if you're interested, you can get a basic idea of the service Graphhopper provides by going to graphhopper.com maps. And, and yeah, there, there, there's a little web interface there that you can play around. You can see how fast it is and it, it's actually quite interesting. Or if you really want to get your hands dirty, you can go and check out their, their routing engine on, on, on GitHub, which they've released under the Apache license. So thank you, Graphhopper. I really appreciate your support. Hey Alistair, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming back. The first episode we recorded together was called Remote Sensing and the Future of Earth, Earth Observation. So that should give the audience a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be talking about today, which is of course Earth Observation. And you are actually Dr. Alistair Graham, so you have a PhD in this. Before we dive into the conversation, perhaps you could just remind the audience uh, what your PhD is in and, and perhaps set the scene a little bit about your involvement with Earth, Earth Observation Remote Sensing. Hi there, thanks very much for having me back on your podcast. It's great to be here again. My PhD was basically looking at irrigation. That's the sort of official, really important one. But the much more highly amusing explanation of what I was doing is I was looking at potatoes using radar from space. So I had, this is back in the late 90s, and I was using ERS-2 radar data basically was looking at a series of different potato fields, trying to look at canopy and soil moisture and model those, and then work out whether or not the crop needed irrigation, because it's a, a very water hungry crop. There was a whole series of modeling exercises and data processing exercises that went into that PhD. Unfortunately, the, the irrigation side of things didn't actually happen because my PhD happened to coincide with the three wettest summers uh, in the previous 10 years. <laughs> So there was absolutely no need to irrigate the crop, but on the science side, everything went went perfectly well. So that was great. Um, yeah, and then since then, I've basically been working in the EO sector, and uh, you can listen to the previous episode to find out sort of a bit more about me, I guess. Yeah, and of course, there'll be an opportunity towards the end of the show where where we mention where people can go to get a hold of you. So yeah, that, that, yeah. that'll be there too. You're not getting off the hook that easy. You talk about <laughs> potato modeling there. Now, I understand that there was a lot of other really interesting processes and challenges involved with that. But what problem were you trying to solve with, with potatoes? Was there a problem at the time? Why was earth observation a good tool for that? Yeah, so there were there were a couple of issues. So one was, well, both were linked to environmental issues. Um, one was just the the use of resources. So in the UK, which is where my study site was, uh, potatoes are grown in an area that has very good soils. But unfortunately, it has, it's a very dry climate. And therefore, a lot of water is sucked out of the rivers and the groundwater. And what they wanted, uh, what the purpose of the research was, was to try and understand if you could monitor the potato crop using radar uh, and then more intelligently apply irrigation waters uh, to the crop. And then the second one was that what had the environment agency, who the body in charge of policing effectively the uh, abstraction of water, for use of in agriculture and other uses, had found that in previous drier summers, a lot of um, growers were actually abstracting water 
when they needed it, which was outside of the license agreement that they had, and therefore it was technically an illegal abstraction. And this meant that sometimes there wouldn't be enough water left for those growers who were adhering to the license conditions. Uh, when And so they weren't able to water, uh, irrigate their crop when they needed to. So another part of the project was to, if we could demonstrate that you could monitor water usage and the provision of irrigation onto a crop uh, in sort of real time, bearing in mind we were using monthly uh, radar data, then it would be a way of trying to stop people just abstracting water whenever they want. Effectively, you could say, right, we can see you from space, so don't don't break your license uh, agreements. And today, I mean, I would love to go back and redo that PhD today with the Sentinel-1 data set that we have. It would be absolutely amazing to have this, this huge, temporally rich data set over the whole growing season and see exactly how it could be done. So I haven't really kept up with the, the radar and potatoes um, <laughs> part of my life, but I, I would be really interested in knowing whether or not this is something that people are still interested in and whether they, you know, they want to try and take that forward. Cause it was, I thought it was a really neat little application at the time, um, using radar data for, for that crop, for that sp specific thing of looking at irrigation and water use. And technically, it's more tricky than you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine it is. But what I'm thinking is a film. I'm thinking there's a story in there about <laughs> potato modelling. We've got police. We've got potential corruption and all of it being, you know, remotely monitored from space. So I, I don't think you should focus on the PhD angle. I think you should go pitch this idea to, to <laughs> Disney. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm liking that. I can see that. The, uh, maybe The Rock should play my character. I think that would be quite good. <laughs> I've never met you in person, but I don't oh, know. Very similar. Very <laughs> similar. Okay. I'll take your word for it. Great. <laughs> okay. So we've set the scene, I hope, for the listeners. We're going to be talking about Earth Observation Remote Sensing. Let's have a, a bit of a definition uh, about these things first. Firstly, Earth observation, for me, that was always remote sensing in the past. Are, are, they, are they two different things, or is this the new na name for remote sensing? Is there any, any difference between e either of those things? Yeah, so in my mind, being a little bit pedantic, there is a difference between the two. So using the Wikipedia definition of uh, Earth observation, it's basically the gathering of information about the physical, chemical, and biological systems of the planet. So that can be via remote sensing technologies, but it's a little bit more than remote sensing. So remote sensing, you don't actually physically touch or interact with the thing that you're monitoring, i.e. it's remote. Um, but if you're looking at Earth observation, you can include things like wind gauges and thermometers and ocean buoys and that sort of thing. So you're you're physically in the medium that you're measuring, but it's being used to observe the Earth system process overall. So that's that's the difference. But I mean, in in terms of day to day discussions, usually the two are interchangeable. And Earth observation is generally used to talk about either satellite or uh, aerial or, or drone imagery and that sort of thing. But there is a little bit more to it. That's just the the thing I'd like to get in people's heads. Appreciate the clarification. And you will have to forgive me if I mix the two up a little bit during this conversation. It's still stuck in my mind that <laughs> everything is remote sensing. But you, please just, just forgive me on that one. Be a little oh, bit I bet patient. I'll do the same. So no worries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, so one of the things that really fascinated uh, me about remote sensing when, when I was doing my, my master's at university was this was the was the process of defining and testing pixel signatures and, and creating accru accurate classifications. And, and that was all a really, really interesting challenge. But I was also doing some GIS courses and it occurred to me that this is remote sensing was a huge and potentially still is a, a massive part of this sort of data manufacturing pipeline. So a lot of the products that come out of remote sensing, earth observation are, are used in other places. So we go from, at least in my mind, we go from continuous data to discrete data. Is is remote sensing, is it still playing the same role in terms of data generation as, as what it was in the past? Or are we seeing other ways of collecting data? Are we, are we Can we jump over that process now? Can we go straight to collecting discrete data? 
yeah, it's quite a bit to unpack there. I mean, basically the the whole of the Earth observation slash remote sensing um, side of things has changed so much in recent years. I mean, and by recent, I mean sort of like the last five years, really, in terms of how much data is available. We're now almost awash with the amount of data that we can capture, um, and there's a lot more systems coming on board over the next few years as well that will capture even more. So I guess really the the important thing now is not necessarily to think in terms of remote sensing or GIS. And I know a lot of people do, like probably the majority of people do, um, even within the, the sector itself, that these are two distinct things. But actually, really, what we're doing is we're geospatial data scientists now. And so being able to understand how to capture data I mean, you, you might not necessarily be the per- person involved in doing the data capture, but understanding the processes involved in data capture, then the pre-processing, the provision of those data out to different software systems and how those can be then used to process the data away from continuous data into discrete is it's all part really of the new what sometimes gets termed the earth data science uh, or the geospatial data science modality that we've got really around the whole sector so yeah there's a i i would say that we're we're, we're not getting away from one or other i think in a way what we're seeing is an amalgamation of all of the different technologies in order to create whatever it is that is required as the end product Thanks for that. I think that's a really important thing that you said there, there, and I think it's also really important um, for people like myself to get away from thinking of remote sensing, earth observation, and GIS as being different things. Like they require different skill sets, but I mean that they're really, really interconnected, and it's important to understand both sides of it. I think if you're doing remote sensing, it's important to understand okay, where are these products that I'm I'm deriving, these data that I'm deriving, where are they going to be used? How are they going to be used? And and vice versa. If you're on the other side, okay, well, where did this come from? What might have been the problems making this? Why does it look like that? I think those understandings are are incredibly important on both sides. Yeah, I think I think a good way to look at it is to think about what's happening in terms of um say web apps or mobile apps and i admit that i don't have a lot of experience in those but you don't necessarily break everyone down into silos and keep them there you you use your systems engineer your systems architect your your web app developer your devops manager you use all those different roles in developing and creating and supplying a single output for for whatever reason that you want to do that. And I think that's where we need to think of ourselves in terms of what we're doing with Earth observation and GIS. I think for too long, we've we've sort of st- stood on opposite sides of the conference room and looked at each other and gone like, well, I can't talk to them because they're, they're not doing raster or they're not doing vector or whatever. And really now we, we should be beyond that. We need to make sure that we're all using the correct types of data and the correct types of technology in order to get to a much more coherent endpoint, which is going to be whatever the client or the application requires. So my hope was with this line of questioning at the start, with with that uh, you know question about the, the definition between uh, or the difference sorry between earth observation and remote sensing, and this question about you know how is data being used. My hope was that that was to kind of set the scene a little bit for for what we're going to be talking about, I, and I, I really hope we haven't confused people with that, but. Uh, the, the, my intentions were good. Let me say it like that. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, Earth observation data sources now. And I know from a previous conversation that, that you've got this sort of clear list in your mind of four different sources that, that we should be thinking about. Of course, there, there, there are others, but could you run us through those four different sources of, of data? Yeah, I suppose if I if I run from the highest altitude to the lowest altitude, and that might be a good way of doing it. So at the highest altitude, we have um, satellites and everything that that encompasses. Um, So they obviously can either be orbiting around the globe or they can be geostationary, which means they sit over a single point, but they basically collect data from space, inverted commas. The next sort of next lowest uh, band of um, data capture platforms that I think of is aerial and so that that could be basically your your 
camera inside an aircraft. And again, those aircraft can be flying at all sorts of different heights and collecting data over different spatial coverages, depending on what it is that they need to be you know, capturing information for. Then closer to the ground again, you have your UAVs and your uh, or your drones. They're sort of the, the new technology, inverted commas again, because, I mean, they've been around for quite some time now, but they're, and they're becoming quite well established as a way of collecting geospatial data. But they have a, a sort of separate niche away from aerial data. And then I suppose right down on the ground or on in the water is your in situ measurements. So this is something that isn't necessarily remote sensing, but it is earth observation. So this is ocean buoys, as I mentioned before, is a really good example where you might have a, a thermometer or a saline meter or something in the water itself. And that buoy stays at a specific point and measures some parameter in the water as the water passes it. So those are my, yeah, those are my four different types of EO data source. And I accept that there are others, like you said, that fit in around those. But those four are probably the sort of the big ones. So if we leave out in situ for a second here, the, these other three sources, if we talk about satellites, aerial and UAV drones, are there sensors out there in the world that can only be used from satellite or where it only makes sense to use them from satellite or aerial or, or drones? Or is uh, are we just talking about a difference in height with which the, the measurement is taken from? Can I use sensors, the same sensors on all of these different platforms? Well, that's, so that's an interesting question because uh, so historically you might have the same sensor types, but probably not the same exact same sensor. So you might have a radar, for example, going back to what I was talking about with my PhD, you could have a radar that was attached to an aircraft and you could have it on a light aircraft or a, a, a sort of a larger aircraft that was going at a higher range and you could collect imagery from that system. And then you could again have a radar on a satellite such as um, ERS satellites or um, the Sentinel-1 satellites that we now have. And they wouldn't necessarily be the exact same sensor system. I mean, they might be very closely related, but there would be a difference in size and power requirements and all of that sort of thing. And and so you would optimize them for depending on where or not where you were going to be taking your collection platform. Now that technologies are becoming smaller and lighter, I, I know that some of the technologies that you have are that you can apply to drones can also be used in aerial systems. And I think, uh, and I might, I, I don't think I'm, I'm wrong in this, but I think they can also be attached into some of the small CubeSats that you get. So CubeSats are typically small uh, clusters of, of small cubes that are 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And you usually get three of these in a row and you use that as your satellite platform. And then you can you basically have power generation component to that and also a gyro stabilization component and then a sensor of some sort. And I th and the, the benefit of having these small sats is that they're low cost, they're easy to develop and they're easy to launch. And I think that, um, yes, yeah, so now I think you can get sensors that will work at all of three of those different um, platform locations. Yeah, because I think previously, if I had asked someone that question, they would have said no, because satellites are so big that they, you know, and they have other power requirements. So the, the sensor payloads are quite different. Aerial is quite different from drones, simply because the platform was so much more powerful. We could put more heavier stuff on a, an aerial platform and fly around than what we could in a drone. But I can, I can see that this sort of gap or this uh, difference between the platforms shrinking, especially you know when you take uh, CubeSats in, into consideration. So I, I yeah, I, I think it's it's an interesting time in terms of what payloads we can we can put on these different platforms. Obviously, performance is, is different, but still the fact that it could be that they're getting closer to each other is, is really interesting. Yeah, I mean it's it's really fascinating. I mean lidar, basically pinging a laser off something, is a another really good example in that we now have lidar systems that can go onto drones and we've obviously had lidar systems on in, in aircraft for quite some time and we've got really helpful really usable lidar systems either on satellites or about to be launched onto satellites and so there's that 
like those those systems now can start to join up and I, I i guarantee you there will be manufacturers out there somewhere who are trying to make lidar systems that will be able to go on all three you know, from the same components um so so yeah it's a really exciting time i think in terms of of being able to capture new data um from all of these different platforms. Yeah, like you said, the fact that they're coming closer together in terms of the payloads, that this means that we'll be able to start you know, joining those data together. And I think this is the new gold rush, actually. I'd be really surprised if, if we're going to improve things so much more in terms of um, analysis that we can do just by putting more satellites into the sky. But, but the combination of satellites, aerial and drones and other technologies if you can, you know, weave them together in terms of their data outputs, I think that's that's where the future lies. Personally, yeah, I, I think it's it's an interesting one. So putting more satellites into the sky has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks in terms of cluttering up the, the various different orbits. But I suppose that can be managed in some respect. But yeah, this whole notion of fusing data from different platform sources is a really interesting one i've one that i find that is just being sort of really looked at in in any detail and i think it's going to become more and more important one of the things that i find quite interesting around the whole satellite earth observation remote sensing sector is there are these two almost these two use cases one is sort of collecting information on a global scale and so that involves its own set of rules and standards and, and sort of data resolutions and everything else. But then a lot of very specific, site-specific project work also gets done. And for that, you sort of almost need a mix of satellite, aerial, and drone data. And and it all comes down to cost, I, I guess, in the end, as to which ones you use. But I think with some of the processing techniques and some of the softwares that are around now, it's much easier to be able to drop in uh, or maybe say start with a satellite time series data for a site that you're interested in looking at some parameter. And then if that's got, if that's not giving you enough uh, temporal fidelity, then you can start to drop in aerial surveys or drone data or whatever. So yeah, there's lots of really exciting things to look forward to, I would say, in the next five years, at least. So uh, I'm really pleased that you talked about cost, because in just a minute, I want to move off and talk about open data versus commercial data. But before I do that, c- can we go back to the the statement you made about CubeSats just before? You talked about them moving in, in groups of three. Um, why is that? Why, why, why three? Uh, so these small sats are built from cuboid components that are 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters and so you would stick three of those together to create a small sat if you see what i mean okay so three separate components that are put together to make one satellite yeah and so one might have the payload in one might have the gyroscopic uh, stabilizer in and one might have uh, the power component or whatever so that that's sort of like the smallest block that you can get really. I mean, I'm sure there are people who could tell you about how you would then take multiples of those small sats and create what they call sort of um, flocks of, of satellites. So you'd have multiple satellites in order uh, going around in a constellation to collect data over the earth at different sort of times or in order to create larger data sets than any individual small sat could create. So, for instance, Planet is a a good example of doing this. Also, ISI, um, I think Capella Space as well, are also going to put up a constellation. So there are a lot of use cases where these smaller satellites are being used um, in combination to create some pretty interesting and very exciting new data sets. So um, still sticking with satellites here, and I promise we'll, we'll move off in just a second, but but, but the, the, this idea of satellites working in, in combination and in pairs with each other, it's not new, uh, at, at least in, not, not in my mind. Haven't we got two satellites, or I can't remember if it's two or three, the, the GRACE project, where they, they work in a pair and follow each other around, and they need to do that f- to be able to, to, to measure what they're measuring? Yeah, there's quite a few larger satellites that go either in are either paired up in order to measure information specifically from that, or they are able to generate improved 
data resolutions by using both satellites rather than just one of them. Um, so Tandem X, I think, is a, a SAR mission where the, I think there's two different um, satellites involved in that as well. So, well, I suppose also you could look at the, the Sentinel satellites. I mean, they don't work together necessarily, but they collect exactly the same information from uh, two different satellites and therefore improves your repeat time back to a, a, a position on the ground or improves your, the amount of coverage that you can get. And so, yeah, there's a, a lot of precedence for using satellites together. But I guess the thing that's different is that with these small sats, what we're looking at when we talk about a constellation is usually sort of uh, many tens of um, satellites together, working together in order to collect the data that is required by by the companies that have put them up there. Okay, so we started off talking about, uh, we started off with our definition of Earth observation remote sensing. We talked about the different data sources. Um, the four that were really important for you were satellites, aerial, AV, UAV, drones, and in situ. And I think we've had a really good discussion around that. So, so thanks very much for that. I'd like to move off now and talk about data because all these platforms produce data. That, that's what we're really interested in. And of course, um, you you have your own consultancy, so you understand this better than others, that tension between open data and commercial data. Most of us in our mind have a list of pros and cons, but I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts around the pros and cons between open and, and commercial data. I would say that my, my personal stance, I'm a big proponent of open data and open standards and open source software. So I that's where I'm coming from is I, I prefer that generally. But I also understand that proprietary and commercial um, software and, and data is required. So in my mind, open data is generally fairly easy to access. So it might, it might not be super simple. You might need to go through an API or something. But it's you know it's usually easy to to find and to download if that's what you you want to do and it's generally easy to understand what it is that you've got in front of you because any information if it's a, a good data provider any information that is um, available about that data is usually published alongside it so for instance I, I know we always come back to to the Sentinel programs but it, there's a, a definite hub where you can go. Um, there are multiple sort of other hubs that have been spawned off of that, but there, there's one central hub. You can go there, you can look around for the data, you can access the data really easily, and you can also get hold of all, all of the documentation about it so you can understand the, the heritage and the lineage of, of those data sets. I realize that, that Sentinel might might be, uh, well, I, I haven't had much to do with it, but I'm sure it's a very well-organized project and, and the data distribution sounds like it's very well-organized also in terms of its metadata. But I think the general sense, uh, consensus around open data is that it's a little bit more difficult to get to and it's sometimes more difficult to understand what you're actually getting. I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that, that your sort of experience with this is that it's more open in every way. So it's it's maybe a little bit harder to find or get a hold of to access in that way, but more open in terms of what am I actually getting? How is it documented? I would have thought that would be the, the more so with the commercial data. So open data in the in what in terms of what we're talking about, which is satellite data, there these aren't just enthusiasts providing data. So th these are large government-backed organizations that are providing it. And so there's this entire structure behind them um, where there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of thought gone into how to provide the data in order for it to get used in the most um, effective way. There's not really a huge help desk component in the background. So although the people will help you with your, your, um, your queries, it's much better for organizations like that to put forward all of the information that you want and for you to find it. So my, I can only go by my experience, but my experience in recent years has been that accessing open satellite data, I can do it quicker. I can find exactly what I want. I can find out exactly what it is that that data is showing me and how it's been processed and to what level and that type of thing. I know 
because it adheres to open standards as well, that it will open in the software that I, I want it to open. So from my perspective, and I accept that I'm coming at it as someone who, who knows what they want, um, but from my perspective, it is much easier than going to a commercial outfit and saying, right, well, I want this, please. And then they say, okay, well, uh, give us an AOI and we'll give you a cost. And then you have to go back to the client and say, well, is this cost okay? And then you have to maybe change the, if it's not okay, then change the AOI to a slightly, sorry, the area of interest that you're looking at to a slightly smaller one, go back and negotiate. And you just go, you waste time doing all this negotiation. And okay, the data at the end might be, might be better for what you're looking at and it's worth that time and effort but i i just find personally i like to be in control of the process myself and if the data and the metadata has been made openly available i can make an informed decision for myself and for my client as to whether or not it's showing us what we need to see and i don't have to have discussions about how much things might cost and then the client doesn't have to have uh, a whole load of internal wrangling about can they afford that? Can they not afford it? So I think personally, open data gives me and my clients more freedom to do the th things that they want to do and to get the answers that we, we're looking for. Yeah, I, I, I think you raise. I think you raise some really, really good points there. Things I hadn't thought about. Obviously, the the price is uh, between the price difference between open data and commercial data is restrictive in itself. But I'd honestly never thought about the the time that might be involved. I mean, that that also has a cost when you're trying to organise things and being cost effective, and any sort of time delay that inevitably adds, you know, adds to the price. So we talked a little bit about. A couple of data portals and i'll put links to those in in the show notes so we've got earth explorer and the sentinel hub um but i've also on my list of things to talk about here i've got things like dedicated search companies what is that how do they work so they are trying to take out some of the the things i've just complained about because like i say i mean there is a definite place for some of the really high resolution proprietary data or commercial data and if that's what's needed in order to get an answer for a given pro problem, then you need to be able to access that. So being able to go to dedicated search companies, and two I can think of are Apollo Mapping, uh, which I think is in the US, and Geocento, which is here in the UK. They take a lot of the stress out of the whole data search. So you can either just contact them and say, right, I, I need information on this area here's my aoi send them a geojson or something for these dates and let them go off and, and they'll find the data that's most relevant and they will come back to you with a price and you know then it's a case of right i'm just dealing with the one company rather than having to go and do lots of searches around different places or quite often i think both of these com uh, companies that i've mentioned do this you can go onto their site and then upload your own aoi and their system does a search in the background and, and gives you a list of potential um, data sets that might be of relevance, and you can choose those. So there are, uh, there are obviously way more um, search companies that do this, and I think really it's something that is a bit of a sticking point in the industry in terms of um, the whole data discoverability and ease of access on the commercial side. And so I, I think it's really good that companies like this exist to take the pain out of, of doing these commercial data source uh, data searches. And, and you can get open data through them as well. So there's an, another one, just looking in my notes. So there's another company called Skywatch that I haven't looked at in enough detail to be able to talk to you about in any detail, but they also look as if they're trying to rapidly allow people to integrate earth observation data into various applications that they might have. So the the whole point of this really is that it's how can you get the data you need with the minimum amount of hassle? Um, I, obviously, with, through my through my own work with, with GIS, I work as a, a GIS consultant or geospatial consultant. So, so data, there's always that tension there when, when you get data. Where do I find it? Is it well documented? How much does it cost? Can I continuously have access to it? Is it a one-time thing? Um, so I appreciate the the 
the market niche these dedicated search companies are trying to trying to fill as well part of me hopes that google is gonna you know do what it says it's going to index everything in the world and in the future we'll just be able to google the data we we want (laughs) that search engine will just take over and it'll be interesting to see what happens there i also appreciate the tension with these that these uh dedicated search companies are trying to solve uh i guess we we see the same thing well, I see the same thing in almost every data portal I've tried to use. There's very few of them out there which are which are user friendly. I, I always feel like you're constricted in some way or lots of different ways. They're slow, they're clunky, they're you know, I, I I'm yet to have a really, really great experience with with a data portal. I'm not a um, user interface designer, so I'm not the one to try and solve this problem. But if anyone's listening and has a good idea of how to solve it or a good example, I would love to hear from it. I'd like to move on the conversation now. So we've talked about platforms. We've talked about uh, a few other concerns uh, around open data, commercial data, where we get it from, how we find it, that kind of thing. What kind of data formats do we typically see in, in Earth observation? So off the top of my mind, I'm thinking GeoTIFF is there. I could imagine uh, ECW would be among them, and I, and I could also imagine web services. Is, is there anything else that you typically see when, when you when you download this data in, term of, in terms of data format? GeoTIFF is definitely the industry standard, and that's moving towards cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, or COGS, which are internally tiled and compressed version of um, GeoTIFF, which is used on cloud infrastructures. And they have a lot of benefits in that you can just access the part of the larger image that you you want to use. So that's certainly check out um, cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs if if you get the chance. JPEG 2000 is another format that's used quite a lot. It's used basically on the the Sentinel um, data provision side. Um, ECW, as you've mentioned, is one of the proprietary data formats that is used, and that's been around quite a long time. But it is so good at compressing the imagery in order to allow it to be moved around, because obviously these images are getting can be quite large, given that they have such large, uh, sorry, such high spatial resolutions these days. So ECW is a, a very useful data format to use, although I find it a little frustrating sometimes because you need a proprietary plugin in order to um, uncompress it and use the data. So from someone who who has a a definite slant towards the open side of things, I don't tend to use ECW so much. And then another one that we might see is something called NetCDF, which is a type of hierarchical data structure. I've come across that in various different uh, guises over the years, and there's quite a lot around the meteorological and oceanographic side of things. So sea surface temperatures, both captured from satellites and also in situ. Um, I've seen information wrapped up in a net CDF format and then distributed that way. So I would say those are probably the main actual data formats themselves, although I guess someone will no doubt um, let me know if there's any others that are being used a lot. But in, yeah, so OGC Web Services, so that's the open geospatial consortium these web services are quite interesting and they're becoming used more and more because as we get more data and we've talked about there being data providers well there's also platforms for processing and there's three main web services that i want to mention here so there's web map services which are effectively takes a picture of the image that you're interested in so let's say it's a satellite image let's let's change and say it's landsat um so it'd be a landsat image of say denmark and you can make a, a, a web map service request and you get back a picture of that image. So it's um, it's like a, a snapshot. If you then wanted to pull the data down on into something like, say, QGIS or ArcGIS, you can make a what's called a web coverage service request. And that pulls the actual raster data itself. And there are reasons why you would do that, uh, and it might be useful for for a given uh, process that you're looking at. But what we're seeing more of a little bit at the moment is something called web processing services. So I've only started coming across these in the last couple of years. So I, I think over the next few years, maybe these will become more and more important. But this is where you would upload effectively a uh, a little recipe to a server and then the data would get processed on the server and you get back your answer and it's the answer that you download so i think these are more or have been more common in the the sort of vector gis side of things 
in recent years, but I'm seeing more and more um, Earth observation remote sensing data being used in this way because we're just getting so much data that really it's no longer useful in terms of downloading lots and lots of information to a local site. You want to be able to process the data where it sits and then um, just get the answer back. And there are lots and lots of different ways you can do that with, you know, you can have Python instances on virtual machines next to the data and things like that. But web processing services is one other way of doing that. So so web processing service, this is the idea of moving the code to the data, the recipe to the to the data, as opposed to moving the data to the code, to, to where it's going to be processed. Yes, it's one of the methods of doing that. Yeah, yeah. So I personally think this is really exciting. Web processing services, I like the idea. And for me, anyway, the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF is, sits on the other side of the fence. So that's an effective way, or it seems like a really, really efficient way of moving large amounts of data, or at least segmenting that data and taking just what you want out of it and moving it down and processing it locally. And I think web processing services, the other side for me anyway, okay, pushing the code over there. But the tension there for me is, who pays for the compute? <laughs> yeah, which is a very good point. Almost really what we've been talking about in terms, excuse me, what we've been talking about in terms of the data formats and the web services is at its sort of lowest level. And what we tend to see these days as well is a whole host of uh, environments that are, are being built on top of this. So they will interact with data in a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF or they might use uh, OGC web services themselves, but the user would log into an account and they would do whatever processing they want through their web browser, or they would use a Python or some other form of API uh, in order to do that. And they might not necessarily interact with these these different standards and these different formats um, at a very low level. But yeah, your question of then who pays for that? Well, if it's if it's a system that you've logged into an account and that's a commercial system, that's fine. You're paying for it. Um, there are different ways that requester can pay for data that they download off of things like um, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, and that that has happened in some instances. Other um, models do exist, but it's very difficult to know because this is one thing I think probably over the twenty odd years that I've been working in geospatial it has been. How do we actually monetize any of these things? Is it per click? Is it per download? Do the data processors pay for it as a service and then people subscribe to that? Or do the people who want the data pay for it and through their subscription? There's, there's a whole host of different ways of thinking about this. And I'm not really sure if it's something that's been answered that successfully. Alistair, I'm really aware of the time. It's marching on. But before I let you go, I've just got one one final question. And, and for me, this is a really exciting question in, in terms of Earth observation. So it feels, or I should say, in previous conversations with other people in the field, there's time and time again that this idea of sub subscribing to objects rather than data sets keeps, keeps coming up. And, and I, I guess this ties in nicely with, with these data that we're talking about how we get the data how we access it and what we've been talking about up until now anyway is just accessing what i guess you could call the raw data although i'm aware it's been processed just by the fact that it's in one of these file formats but we're still accessing the data and this idea of subscribing to objects instead of data sets is that just show me all the cars in that image please is that the correct way of understanding it yeah, I think so. Um, so there's there's different ways of looking at it. So you can either have a parameter that you want to to subscribe to. So it could be, I don't know, yeah, show me all the cars, or and and then every day you get an update in the number of cars that are in a car park or whatever. Or another one is um, you can subscribe to a, a set area, so an area of interest or multiple areas of interest. So that could be. Uh, have any new houses been built on this green belt piece of land, something like that. And then you would only get an update sent through to you when your rule has been triggered. So yes, a new house has been built. Send a, send a message saying you want to check out the imagery. Um, so that's, I would say those two things are definitely some interesting ways in which um, data dissemination is going to be used because nine times out of 10, I would imagine most users of the data, if they're not inside 
the geospatial uh, realm like we are, most users just want the answer to whatever it is that they're trying to um, find an answer to, rather than being, they're not going to want to look at imagery unnecessarily and then download it and process it and everything else. So even if that's automated or semi-automated, what they want to do is subscribe to something that tells them, yes, the thing you're interested in has changed or has been updated or has disappeared or whatever it is. Is there anybody out there at the moment that's doing this really well? Is there like an example of a subscription service like this that, that we could go and check out? There are companies that do it, but I don't have a subscription to it, so I wouldn't know how well they're doing it. So I I wouldn't want to say at this point about who those might be because, I mean, I'm guessing they, they're doing it. It's, they certainly seem to be leading the field, um, but I would prefer to to have direct experience of, of what these subscription services would be like, I think, before commenting on, on whether it's working well or not. So uh, on that note, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I've really appreciated it. I've also really appreciated your patience walking us through uh, the definitions of remote sensing, where, where these or what platforms are out there generating data, how they're generating it, what the difference are between between the platforms, how we find data, and, and yeah, all the other things we've talked about today. Much appreciated. Really enjoyed the conversation. Where can the listeners go if they want to reach out to you or, or learn more? The two obvious bases would be either my website, which is jogger.co.uk, so that's G-E-O-G-E-R.co.uk, or you can also find me at uh, Seen From Above podcast, so that's seenfromabove.org, or on Twitter, and you can use the hashtag Seen From Above, or I'm A-J-G Jogger, G-E-O-G-E-R. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel, for having me back on this. It's been really enjoyable to talk about. Um, different aspects of Earth observation. It's been my pleasure. Thanks again. Thanks once again to our sponsor, Graphhopper. I really appreciate your support. It's fantastic having a, a company like you behind us. It's much appreciated. To the listeners, if you're looking to solve the traveling salesman problem or if you're looking to do anything with routing optimization for, for larger fleets of vehicles, check out graphhopper.com. You can support the podcast by supporting them. Thank you. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in again this week. Much appreciated. I also want to thank the people that have taken the time to reach out to me on, on social media, find me on LinkedIn to engage, to, to give their feedback about the podcast. It, it really helps me figure out what direction to take things in, to find out what you're interested in, what you're less interested in you know how i can improve this this for you so your support your your comments and your your engagement is really really appreciated thank you very much talk to you again next week bye